Good evening, everybody. Good evening, welcome. Just wait for everyone to join us. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Just got a few more people popping in. Give it another few seconds. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for your patience. Over the last couple of minutes, we've just been having a few technology problems, but hopefully we are up and running now. Um, so thank you for joining us. We've made it to February. Spring is inching closer. But until it finally gets here, we intend to keep you fully entertained um, with the remaining part of our winter webinar series. Um, and tonight we are taking you to my favourite place in the world, the European mountains. Um, some of the Nature Trek team have been back live today. They've been at destinations in London. So that's the first time we've been there since 2020. It's been really nice to be back seeing people in person. If you're in London or in the area, feel free to, to pop by and say hello. But for everyone else, we are here to, to entertain and inspire you again this evening. Um, I am delighted to even be joined by three of our wonderful tour leaders. Um, we've got David Morris, we have got Bruce Middleton and Simon Woolley, all have led a huge variety of tours between them over the years. Um, we have had leaders of the, this series join us from Ecuador, from Brazil, from India, Nepal, Kenya. Um, but the connection I'm most worried about tonight is Bruce's, um, just south of Bodmin Moor. Um, it's looking a bit ropey, <laughs> a bit nervous about what's going to happen after the break. But we will we'll see what happens. Um, I think what we will need to do is rather than having our usual interval slide and lovely music, we're going to try and get Bruce's presentation working during that 10 minute break. So bear with us during that. Um, but we'll we'll do the first half first. Um, as usual, we have the chat function for you to use um, ask us questions, say hello, share your um, stories and memories with us. And we have the question and answer box which you can type questions that we'll answer during the evening um, and we'll wrap up at the end as well um, as we go so there'll be a little session at nine o'clock when we when we come to the end um, i'm actually going to kick off the evening i'm going to tell you about two of my favorite places in switzerland bengen and the upper engadine and then hand straight over to david who's going to take us to another part of switzerland to ballet and then poodle on over to the french Pyrenees. Uh, then we'll have a break and then bruce will take us to austria and bavaria before Simon wraps up the evening in the Carpathian Mountains. So there is a lot to look forward to and a lot to enjoy. Um, and without further ado, I am going to crack on with telling you all about lovely Switzerland. Um, so I'll say goodbye to David and Simon and Bruce for a bit. Um, you're very welcome to turn your cameras off and do whatever you want for 10 minutes. Um, and we'll see you again shortly. So let's head over to the Swiss Alps. I'm just gonna turn this off, there we go. As I said, I am going to start off in, in Switzerland and two of our original tours that we have been running for many, many years at Nature Trek. We are going to start off by going to Bengen. Um, I've just got a little pointer on, which is just here in the Alps. And then we're gonna head over to Pontresina. Um, usually I'd probably carry on and talk to you about Valais as well and Bet Alp down here. But um, I spent three days wrecking that trip when I was heavily pregnant. Dave's been leading it for several years now, so he's much the better man to talk to you about that tour these days. Oh, not, so that's why I'm going to hand over to him to carry on and take you down to ballet. We'll kick off in Wengen, which is our original Swiss Alps tour. Um, we have been going there for more than 20 years. We have stayed in the same hotel for most of that time. And Wengen really is the epitome of chocolate box Switzerland. We um, get there via a flight to Zurich, and then we take the train from Zurich. And this is a tour where you're not going in a minibus at all during a week away. It's all on the very efficient Swiss public transport. It is three trains from Zurich up to Bengen, the last one being the Cogwheel Mountain Railway, this, um, which, which is an absolute delight. It, some people feel a bit nervous about the idea of doing all those train connections. Um, some of them are quite tight, but they are, 
efficiently planned so that you hop off on one platform, step over and, and hop onto the next train, or at least that's the plan. And usually it works out like that. We, we very rarely miss any connections, if ever, in Switzerland. Um, but it's wise not to, to pack too heavily. You want to you know, take what you can carry with you. But as ever, our tourists are there to help you and make sure you know exactly where you're going and, and when. So Wengen is a car-free town. So once you get there, you remain no minibuses, no cars. We're on the trains and the cable cars throughout the week. Um, we provide you with a pass, a Jungfrau pass. So that gets you on all of these different modes of transport. That's really nice because we use it to go uphill. Um, we, we ascend the mountain in the morning um, and then we will pot around, look at all the new floor that there is to see, and then we'll take our time generally walking back down to our hotel. So most of that walking is, is undulating flat or downhill. The pass also gives you the freedom to um, hop on and hop off as you wish. And if you want to do something else one day, you want to take it a bit slower, you want to take the train back to the hotel rather than walking, then you have that pass and, and you can do that. So as I said, we stayed at the same hotel in Bengen for, for many years. It's the Berghaus Hotel um, and the family there look after our groups really well. Um, you can um, opt to have one of these rooms that faces south over the Jungfrau and you have beautiful views. It can enjoy the Alpen glow in the evenings as the sun sets over the Jungfrau. And then the backdrop for our week are the impressive, impressive three week, three, <laughs> lost my hot talk, the impressive peaks of the Eiger, the Munch and the Jungfrau. So the Eiger, this one over here, is the Ogre. The Munch, the Monk is in the middle and the Monk is protecting the Jungfrau, the young girl, um, from the mighty Ogre. This photo is actually taken in Muren, which is across the valley from Wengen. Um, we actually run another tour, Go Slow in the Swiss Alps, which is based in Muren, um, another, another village as you can see beautiful views and where again we're using public transport um, to get us all over the place throughout the week but that tour is designed with more options to opt in and opt out so shorter walks in the morning um, with maybe an optional slightly longer walk but, but plenty of um, rests and places to potter and just takes it a lot more easy um, than, than our other Swiss tours where you, you do want to walk and be able to enjoy walking in the mountains. And here above Metvengen on the Manlika mountain, the views dominated by that mighty north face of the Eiger. And these are the views that you get and the turf here, you can see it's just absolutely filled with, with flowers at this time of year. So you can see the primulas, the gentians, the ranunculus in there. Um, it is is absolute heaven. We were not tours um, to Wengen in the second half of June when the flora should typically be at its best. Um, the weather's unpredictable. We've had snow, water, wall, sunshine, rain, hail, everything in between. Um, but the good thing about these trips is that you can botanize it all manner of different altitudes. So there's always something out and um, at, at some level, there's always, always plenty to see. So even on years where we go up the mountain and it's all covered in snow still, you're not short of, of amazing things to see. So lots of gentians, like these trumpet gentians um, and these spring gentians, gentiana verna, there's just you know, beds of them everywhere. Um, and some more examples of things you might be looking for during our week in, in Wengen. Up at the top left, we've got Narcissus flowered anemone, um, alpine toad flax there on the top right, um, beautiful alpine pass flowers, sometimes just coming out, sometimes with the fluffy sea heads I've just gone over. Um, and then my favourite flower, um, the Trollius europaeus or globe flowers, which I just always think that my little balls of sunlight um, up there in the mountains. We expect to see lots of primulas. Um, these ones on the left is bird's eye primula, primula farinosa. Um, and on the right, the bear's ear, primula auricula. As we ascend higher up, there are some, some real specialties where the glaciers are seeding. So this is one of them. So it's a little viola, viola sinesia. And this is another um, highlight of, of um, our botanizing during the week. This is um, alpine columbine, Collegia alpina. And one really special um, flower that we're all hoping to see is the lady slipper orchid. Um, we've got a really good site where we can go and again people often ask which is the best week to go to see the flower to see the, the lady slipper orchids and it's it's really hard to say um possibly the earlier week ooh, but I don't know uh, it depends on the season but there are years when we'll go and we'll see hundreds upon hundreds of them all the way up the mountainside um 
all flowering um, in absolute splendor. So the walking, as I mentioned, is, is variable, but generally undulating or downhill. This photo is one of the trickier walks that we do. Um, so have a look at this. If you feel like you do this, then you'll probably be fine for the week. Um, the nature of botany is that we are never going at a fast pace. And we'll generally pot around making very little progress in the morning, seeing everything, identifying everything, enjoying all the new flora that there is to see that morning. We'll have some lunch and then we'll, we'll take it easy in the afternoon and, and do a bit more walking. Um, so this is walking down the moraine from the Eiger lecture station. You see walking poles are useful. Um, they're always useful to take the strain off your knees anyway. Um, and as is typical in the mountains, here you can see that it's clouding over. Um, this week that I was there, it was water wall sunshine, apart from this, this particular moment where suddenly the clouds came in. Um, about half an hour later, we were being hailed on. And an hour after that, we were sat outside in the sunshine again, enjoying it got dark. So you just have to be prepared and so you have to be able to carry a bag and carry some sensible layers in it and be prepared for all eventualities. Um, we'll always find a good picnic spot, so we'll generally carry the picnics with us during the day, um, as we do on many of our European tours around um, um, tours around Europe. Um, take a lovely picnic, sit in the sunshine. Um, you can always find a cafe if it's wet at some point, go and get a coffee. Um, but there's always really an absolutely delightful place to, to stop. And um, what I'm not mentioning at all in my little section of um, the talk this evening is the, the bird life, the, the mammals, the butterflies, of which there are plenty in Switzerland, but I'm leaving all that to Dave. So um, these tours that I'm talking about are primarily botanical tours, but we won't ignore everything else by any stretch of imagination. But I'm going to let Dave fill you in on all those other bits shortly. So over in Pontresina, this is the Upper Engadi Valley, right over the other side of Switzerland in the east, quite close to the Italian border. Um, this is in the canton of Graubünden, which is the only trilingual canton in Switzerland. So German, Italian and Romansch are all official languages. Can get quite confusing, you're not really sure what anyone's speaking. But here the geology and the high altitude make it quite different, um, quite interesting. So often we'll find that some people will come and do um, our Wengen tour, come back the next year to Pontresina. A lot of people do them both back to back and you can stick with the same tour leader the whole way through. Again, we're absolutely sport for public transport. We get round um, this week on the UNESCO Heritage Bernina Express Line. There are some amazing loops and tunnels. Um, so for some people, um, transport itself is a highlight of this trip. And again, you get a pass for the week. So you're free to, to opt out if you want to come home early, that sort of thing. As I said, there's quite different flora in the Upper Engadine. So this little star Edelweiss, you wouldn't find in Wengen, but you will in, um, over in the Upper Engadine. Um, I took this photo in early July and you can see it's only just starting to come out. So um, it is a later season there because it is higher. Um, and we'll go really high up. We'll take the cable cars, um, we'll go over 3000 meters. So we'll be looking for some really high altitude specialties. Um, and the mountains that you can see in the background there are the Benina group of peaks, providing a really splendid backdrop each day. So again, there's some really, it's just remarkable really what grows at this altitude. This is a little mignonette leaved bittercress, um, cardamony, cardamony rosettifolia. We'll see lots of glacier crowfoot, um, poking out all these rock crevices. Sometimes there'll be a huge splash of pink in the rocks, and this is the very beautiful alpine rock jasmine. Sometimes you'll see a splash of blue in the rocks, and we go up on our cable car and you can see the blue on your way up, and this is another star of the trip, Eritrechium nanum, or King of the Alps. There's a different selection of primulas up here. This one is primula latifolia, and then this one is primula integrifolia, and there's also lots of hybrids between the two, which can get quite confusing. Um, and depending on the season, we um, will or invariably encounter snow melts along the way. It's very common. So here um, we're walking around Val Minor. You can see in the turf all of this purple, and that's those those primulas that we just saw, and loads of snowbells. And the snowbells, soldanellas, they will um, come through even when the snow is still there melting and then through the damp turf and they'll just stretch right up way up the mountainside just turning the whole thing purple absolutely beautiful 
And again, we will always find a fantastic spot to have our picnics. So on this particular day, we spend a lot of time in the morning, botanizing very high up. Um, and this particular day is our, our longest day of walking. We might do nine or 10 miles on this day. Um, it's probably one of the tours with, with the most walking um, of our European trips. Um, but it's amazing. We'll have lunch up here. Um, and then we'll almost transect the mountain on the way home. We'll walk back to the hotel and you'll be looking at flowers at every altitude the whole way down. Um, it, it's incredible. Um, plenty of options, um, lots to see and lots more besides the flora. And I think at this moment, I am gonna hand over to um, David to continue our journey around Switzerland um, and take you to Valais. As I said, I, I, spent, um, I spent a lot of time in Switzerland over the years, um, but only a few days of wrecking that tour um but days are leaving it ever since so let me hand you over to him he will continue the journey around switzerland and then to the french pyrenees and i'll be back in the break to, to get us all sorted thank you all thanks kerry over to you get my slides up so yeah Evening everyone. Yeah, I'm, I'm David Morris. I'm, uh, I've been leading for Nature Trek now for about 18 years, I think, this year, somewhere in that, that region. Um, and uh, my day job, I work for the RSPB as an as a area manager, um, and I'm also uh, president of the Alpine Garden Society. So uh, kind of mountains, and particularly kind of mountain plants and mountain birds is really my passion. And uh, yeah, a couple of great tours tonight that I want to talk to you about, uh, which I'll leave for Nature Trek. Uh, the first is uh, is the one in the Swiss Valleys that um, it's just south of the uh, the Wengen area that Kerry talked about earlier. Um, so it's quite nice for us to see that that mountain range that they look at down to the south, but we look up to the north of it and then looking south towards the Italian border. And um, this is kind of Classic day walk uh, in that region, uh, fantastic forests, meadows, right up to some quite high altitude mountain areas. So a bit of geography for those that want it. So we fly into uh, Geneva um, again, like, like the tours Kerry's talked about, these are tours that are single destination and uh, making use of the fantastic Swiss public transport system. So again, it's kind of two to three changes on the train, depending on which trains we go, but really straightforward, lots of time for uh, getting about. Again, I've not managed to lose anyone, uh, and there's usually myself and uh, my co-leader, Bob, who are there to help carry and get your luggage onto the train. Um, so yeah, we take the, the train, a scenic trip around Lake Geneva um, and up into Brig, and then change again to get the local cog railway, which is also part of the fantastic Glacier Express line that goes from Zermatt up and over uh, the pass, um, and then uh, make full use of the cable cars. And yeah, we stay up in the village of Betmeral, that you can see on the map there. It's another traffic free village uh, tucked right up in the Alps um, and get the cable car uh, from the train up to the, up to the village. So yeah, this is uh, Betton Tile Station where the train pulls in, we get off here and then take the cable car up to the village. And I'll just give you a bit of a, a kind of an overview map um, in the summer of what that, uh, that area looks like. So you can just see Betmer Alp down here, sat at uh, just under uh, 2000 metres. Um, this whole area is what we, we really explore uh, throughout the week. Uh, all on foot, um, really kind of nice day walks up to about sort of six miles, um, like Kerry does on those trips. Uh, we make as much use of the cable cars um, and public transport as possible. So generally taking the legwork out by getting the cable cars up to some of the peaks that are yeah up to around 3,000 metres um, and then descending some of the way and often getting cable cars back part way as well. So really enjoyable day walks around that area. And we also, you'll have seen uh, from the map, uh, take a, a trip further south into the Valais um, and drop down to uh, Zermatt and go up towards the Matterhorn range, which you actually get panoramic views from the hotel. So that's Betmeralp um, in, in the foreground there, looking across the Rhone Valley 
and you can see over towards the sort of Matterhorn, Weisshorn, some of the big peaks on the Italian border. Uh, our hotel is just uh, tucked in below the uh, the first white property there, and it gives those sort of grandstand views over over the valley. Um, I think it's probably one of the best hotels that I've uh, ever uh, stayed at on nature trek trips. Fantastic hotel, great facilities, fantastic food, fantastic owners. And yeah, you can just kind of walk around and you can walk from there in the morning. I know often we kind of do pre-breakfast bird walks into some of the woods. There's black grouse around here, range of good woodpeckers. And really, as soon as you get off the off the cable car at the top, the birding starts. There's kind of nutcrackers around the village, some hard to see mountain species, things like citral finch, alpine chuffs, golden eagle, even kind of kicking around the sort of valley around the hotel. Um, so certainly an entertaining first breakfast in the morning with some of these kind of quite difficult to get European species and uh, sort of indulging us just outside the hotel. This is uh, the Betna Sea just above the hotel. This is the, the sort of typical landscape that we're walking around. It's quite a nice contrast to Wengen and the Engadine in that the geology is a bit more mixed. So some of it's quite acidic rock and some of it's on limestone. So you get a different flora in the different areas, which is interesting for the sort of botanical perspective. Some of the plants that we encounter, well, we typically work our way through the different sort of montane alpine zones, um, range of really attractive things. We've got kind of uh, the bearded bellflower, Campanula barbata, good range of orchids, particularly some of the ones that like the acidic substrates, things like black vanilla orchid here. Um, and then this particular part of Switzerland, you also get the yellow form of the alpine pass flora, this uh, subspecies apiflora, which, which grows in profusion along with things like globe flower and other species, small white orchid. And at that time of year, we also get the first few kind of martagon lilies starting to open up as well on some of the uh, heathy slopes. And then like the other two Swiss trips, we generally hunt out snow melt. So we're up on this trip in around kind of late June, early July. There's very often hollows and snow patches. And the last year that I've just done was a particularly warm, mild winter, yet we still managed to hunt out some good snow patches. And, and it's here that we look out for things like some of the kind of early crocuses that are going over, some of the, the kind of snow bells. And also things like this, this is Pulsatilla vernalis. This is uh, one of the really attractive past flowers that uh, is a kind of classic snow melt species up there. Really short, diminutive little thing. Uh, but yeah, fantastic uh, splashes of colour with the crocus and in the background, uh, a really great cafe that we often visit. And uh, yes, uh, good food, good food extends to some of our uh, stops. Uh, Bob and I are particularly good at finding cafes and uh, apple strudel uh, throughout the tour, as well as uh, really good views of marmots. Um, Marmots of both varieties, certainly plenty of marmots around, around the hotel area. Behind the hotel, there's a marmot trail, a kind of easy guided walk that people do looking for alpine marmots. Um, but I think why I like this trip to the Alps is just the range of species that we get. So I'm very interested in the kind of birds, the plants, the butterflies, the mammals, the reptiles. So we see a good range of things, things like uh, a good range of butterflies. So you've got things like um, scarce copper, alpine heath and then you've got some of the kind of higher altitude bird species so down in the woods you've got kind of black grouse which we often go out in the morning looking at them lecking and then you've got things like ptarmigan up, up high on the kind of bearer slopes one of the great features of that area is the the greater Alec glacier so this is a huge glacier uh, biggest glacier in Europe and it kind of comes down from the uh, the sort of uh, the Eiger, which is kind of just around the corner and that sort of range up uh, to the south of Wengen, carves its way through is a, is a kind of real feature that many of our walks kind of go parallel with this. And yeah, on the slopes here, it's adorned in things like uh, Rhododendron, Ferruginium and things like trailing uh, Azalea and a different range of gentians as well in this area, particularly ones that like uh, some of the acidic rocks. So this is the shortleaf gentian, Gentiana brachyphylla. So yeah, some, some different plants here that you probably won't find over at Wengen or the Engadine. 
As I say, cable cars are the choice of transport to get to the top. So this is uh, the Igisthorn cable car that gets you right up onto the Igisthorn cable station. We often have some uh, picnics up here with uh, this kind of panoramic 360 view. Some brilliant plants around here. You've got things like snow finches breeding in the cable station. And then the, the image the top there with the cross, that's the top of the Betmer Horn uh, just above uh, Betmer Alt Village. So... Yeah, a little bit of legwork, but a lot of work from the cable cars gets you into some really great places. And yeah, the glacier in the background and there in the foreground, we've got things like glacier crowfoot uh, just, just starting to come out with the snow melt as well as kind of glacier mouse ear for the, uh, the attentive botanists that can see that one in the background. And also get up high, so kind of three, three and a half thousand metres go, particularly I quite like some of these kind of montane alpine cushion species. So we often find at least three species of these cushion forming androsaces, members of the primula family. We have uh, androsy vandellii that likes the acidic rocks behind the uh, hotel on the Betmerhorn. We've got androsy alpina and the Swiss rock jasmine, this kind of white one, as well as kind of uh, purple mounds of... Uh, um, purple sac mountain saxifrage good birds up there as well um you often get really great views of species like alpine accenta snowfinch and then last year for the first time was the first lamagayas that we've had on the trip so lamagaya are starting to spread into the alps now um so i'm kind of hoping that lamagaya is going to be a kind of regular feature of this tour as well uh, delighted to see lamagaya last year the hay meadows around Betmer Alp are utterly spectacular. And at the time of year we're going, um, they've not quite cut them yet, yet they're at their absolute peak. Really great plants within there, some fantastic orchids, hay meadows species. You've got things like this Eryngium, this is Queen of the Alps, a big robust thistle-like plant, and all on these tight, deep slopes with the traditional vernacular buildings. So kind of really nice cultural heritage there. And an absolutely dazzling array of butterflies and other invertebrates that we find on this trip. So, I mean, this is just a selection of some I've photographed over the last few years on the trip. A vast number of kind of fritillaries. You've got um, a whole range of kind of coppers. Um, yeah, you name it. There's, there's a, a dazzling array of butterflies for the sort of butterfly enthusiast and many kind of alpine montane species and some that are found within just that part of Switzerland as well. Um, pick a good weather day um, and we travel um, again, a couple of trains from the hotel, uh, go down towards Zermatt uh, along the Glacier Express line, fantastically scenic line, and then pick up the uh, the Gornagrat barn to take the train up to the Gornagrat to give really a, a kind of yeah fantastic views over the Matterhorn um, and some of the other big peaks around that area. Um, Get off the uh, barn up at the Gornagrat. Um, a few few plants that we don't normally see up at uh, Betmer Alp. So particularly the kind of limestone influence here. We get King of the Alps. We've got kind of things like Matterhorn Pennycrest. And again, like in Wengen and the Engadine, they're kind of a turf studded with gentians and primulas with that iconic Matterhorn background. And do a really nice day walk there uh, past the... Um, a blousey where hopefully we get a day like that where we get a crystal clear day not much wind and you get the iconic matterhorn reflection in the betness in the uh the blousey there so that's the uh the uh, valets trip that we do um in in sort of late june early july and then i'm moving on to the french pyrenees now so this is one of the oldest nature trek trips that um, the organization runs. This, this was a trip that first started in the early 90s during uh, the kind of Gulf War turmoil when nature trek concentrated on starting to do many of its European trips. And um, David and Marion Mills kind of first wrecked and did this trip. And um, it's been a trip that I've led a number of times uh, over the last uh, 20 years. Again, for me, it's a bit like the Valais trip. It's a really great trip into the mountains to see a good range of kind of plants, butterflies, birds and herbs. Um, we tend to go here in around kind of mid early June um, and a bit bit like the, the Valais trip. It's a single uh, hotel 
Uh, but this time I'm driving a minibus around and I tend to do walks with the other leader where we can kind of do circular walks or walk from A to B. Um, and they, they tend to be the same, um, largely where we can kind of uh, not climbing up peaks, um, take taking advantage of any kind of infrastructure there is and about kind of six miles a day, really nice day walks with a picnic. Um, geologically, mostly limestone in this region. So where do we go? So we we fly into Lourdes, the kind of top top map on the left, um, into the sort of uh, maritime um, mid Pyrenees, um, and then it's a kind of short drive up into the Pyrenees National Park, where we stay in Jedra, um, still stay in the same hotel that Nature had been going to since the the nineteen nineties, um, and from here it's a kind of range of very short drives, park up the van for the day and go out and do some really great walks. I've kind of highlighted some of the sort of main areas I take people to um, on the trip, places like uh, the Osu Valley, uh, go up to Port de Bouchereau, which is a, a road that the French built right up onto the Spanish border. And then the Spanish never kept their end of the deal and put the uh, the road over into Spain. Um, and get up towards the Brescia de Roland, which you can see from the Hotel Brescia de Roland, where we stay in Jedra. Trip into the Cirque de Gavane, the Cirque de Storbe and Cirque de Tremuse. These cirques are big thousand metre limestone cliffs that uh, hug the French uh, Spanish border. Um, and then uh, often I'll take a trip down to uh, the Col de Tourmalet, the kind of famous uh, kind of um, uh, route, cycle route, where again, you can drive up to very high altitude and get some really good high altitude birds and plants. So stay at the Hotel Brescia Roland. Um, get, as I say, it's the hotel that Nature Tech first started to use. Really great location, really nice, comfortable hotel. Great owners that have been there all that time. Some fantastic uh, traditional sort of French cuisine, French wine. Um, and it's kind of claim to fame as well. Which this hotel hosted uh, the French botanist Ramond, um, which uh, some of the endemic plants of that area uh, were named after. And there's a kind of plaque to Ramond on the hotel um, that we point out. I always um, kind of wind the group up on the way out there about saying we need to get to the hotel for the five o'clock Lama Gaia. And very often I'm not lying. Uh, the birding starts as soon as you get out of the minibus at the hotel. And there's a cliff face just opposite the hotel, which have llama guys roost on most evenings. And, uh, yeah, you can generally see llama guy coming into roost of an evening. See llama guys pretty much daily on this trip, uh, along with a range of other raptors, including things like short-toed eagle. There's a photo I took a couple of years ago of them doing that kind of classic behaviour of taking... Uh, bits of carcasses up and bones and dropping them to break them and kind of some of the livestock or things like chamois that we see up there um, on the trip. As I say, these huge, impressive thousand metre cliffs uh, that line the French-Spanish uh, border uh, really frame the backdrop for this trip, along with a range of spectacular meadows and some fantastic woodlands and then the kind of alpine montane zone. Orchid enthusiasts are generally pretty pretty happy with a with a trip here. A good range of um, kind of European montane orchid species. You've got the kind of uh, smelly form of uh, bug orchid, Orchis coreophora, uh, the subspecies fragrans with a nice kind of scent to it. You've got things like uh, dark red hellebarines, and again, you've got some of the kind of vanilla orchids that we come across in the alpine turf. Again, butterflies are plentiful. Um, often find things like this, butterflies uh, salting on dung or kind of springs that come out on roads, which often have clouds of mixed species of things like Adonis blue, some of the heath fritillaries, uh, some of the skippers, small blue. Yeah, re really great for butterflies is this trip. And also I think it's really good for herps as well. So pretty much most of the uh, most of the trips I've done Every year I've, I've managed to find two or three species of snake, including every year I've always found this. This is asp viper. This is uh, one of Europe's most poisonous snakes. But there's a series of walls in places where I often find asp viper early on in the morning coming out to sun and pose themselves. As you can, you can just see its head and its slightly horned nose there um, waiting to be photographed. So 
I tend to kind of explore the different sort of altitudinal zones and habitats. We've got Jedra down in the bottom here. Often explore some of this kind of montane woodland. This is the Hias Valley, where we, we start to look for some of the kind of montane woodland plants. You've got uh, the white form of um, an alpine pass flower that we saw in um, up in um, uh, the valleys. And then we've got things like the, the sort of introduction to the range of endemic starts here. So there's a, a huge range of endemic plants in the Pyrenees. So we've got things like Pyrenean honeysuckle that we find within the woodlands, along with the sort of more widespread species, things like herd Paris and the delightful sort of Hepatica nobilis. This is a kind of liver leaf, which is a really spectacular woodland plant that grows across across a range of Europe, but unfortunately doesn't occur in, in the UK, but plentiful with some really fantastic leaf variations in the, uh, the Pyrenean population. Good range of bulbous plants as well for the, uh, the botanists. So we've got Lillian martagon, um, Turk's cat lily, um, and we've got the endemic lily Pyrenaicum, another kind of Turk's cat lily, fantastic yellow one. Um, for any, any gardeners in the audience, uh, be pleased to know that I've also found these absolutely infested with lily beetle that infest my plants in the garden back here in the UK. Um, you've got kind of Pyrenean uh, bluebell squills and kind of things like St. Bruno's lily as well. So some, some really nice spring flora. As I say, butterflies are great. And I think one of one of the species that most clients want to see is is often Apollo, um, and the wooded meadows around the kind of Hears Valley are uh, pretty much nailed on for uh, Apollo, along with clouded Apollo as well. And and often, as I say, you can get some incredibly good encounters with that fantastic butterfly species with these sort of big papery wings. Range of other invertebrates as well. This is sulfur owlfly that looks like a butterfly, but these kind of glide around, uh, kind of lacewing relatives that are quite quite voracious predators as larvae. Now we start to come up out of the valleys onto the kind of uh, plains that are kind of grazed with the kind of summer transhumance grazing. These are the kind of shepherd huts on the plateau de Cumley that overlooks down into the valley with Jedra below. Here we start to get a range of kind of more montane species in the meadows and some of the rocky areas. So you've got things like the endemic uh, horned pansy, viola canuta, um, some of the primula starts. This is primula hirsuta, the hairy primula, which has these kind of fantastic hairy leaf, but sticky leaf backs. And then you've got geranium cinerean. Um, this is a fantastic little geranium that grows in the alpine turf and is, has been a kind of a plant hybridizer's delight with these fantastically uh, marked flower petals. Good range of orchids up there as well. So you've got a couple of species of marsh orchids. You've got Dactylorhiza marginalis and maculata. And then you've got elder flowered orchid, uh, Dactylorhiza uh, sambacina, which comes in a kind of yellow and a purple form. And kind of at that time of year is just uh, kind of adorning some of the, the slightly moister areas of the kind of alpine turf. So okay, the moister areas, uh, this is a, a species that I always kind of look out in the kind of cold, really oxygenated um, streams. This is Pyrenean brook newt. And got kind of male and feet, much bigger female here. Um, these are kind of endemic um, uh, herp to that area um, that are often kind of people are keen to see. And then you've got some other goodies that we kind of look out for at that time of year. So and this is the English iris, iris latifolia. Um, a lot of people often ask me, is it native? Because it kind of almost looks out of place, this fantastic uh, uh, iris that uh, flowers in kind of June, along with you can see some sort of St. Bruno's lilies in the background as well on some of these slopes overlooking some of the bigger peaks. As I say, that time of year, transhumance happens. So this is the process where the village, uh, the people bring their kind of livestock up from the valley bottom, traditionally walking them very often past our hotel in an evening um, and then up to these kind of higher altitude cirques for the kind of summer grazing. These uh, so these cirques are areas that we kind of walk into, birding and botanizing along the way and um, often have a really great range of plants in there at that time of year. So you've got kind of rush leaf daffodil. This is Narcissus asoanus. This is a, a really tiny diminutive little alpine daffodil that uh, grows there. You've got uh, creeping globularia, 
This is, a, again, another Pyrenean endemic that forms mats over rocks and at that time of year is often full out in flower. And then you often smell this plant before you see it. And this is Daphne neorum, which is a, one of the kind of montane dwarf alpine Daphnes that grows in the turf there. Really pungent smell from these pink flowers. A couple of other Pyrenean endemics that we tend to search out on the plants as well. So you've got Fritillaria pyrenaica, which if we're in luck, can have adorned slopes blooming at that time of year, along with uh, Saxifraga longifolia, which has these big dinner plate-like uh, rosettes. It's monocarpic, and after a few years, they all flower on mass and uh, then die and set masses of seed, but but really attractive uh, saxifrage that we kind of look out for on some of the rocks, boulders and cliffs. Very scenic river valleys, Quite a lot of these kind of, this is the barrage to Osu, um, some really nice kind of alpine meltwater uh, lakes up there, and some really great birding to be had on here. Things like rock thrush here, uh, not, not blue rocks, this is the proper rock thrush, the kind of really rusty and blue one. Plenty of marmots. Um, and marmots are your best friend uh, going on a tour up there because when they start whistling, look overhead and it's either a llama guy or one of the, the kind of hundreds of griffin vultures that we uh, we see throughout the trip. That, and these things just come down the valley very low, giving kind of photographers really great opportunities for uh, photographing them as they pass overhead. Couple of days, we'll do some walks into the Cirque de Gavani, and we kind of walk down through the alpine turf, go looking for things like black woodpecker in the woodland here before going into the Cirque for a picnic lunch, maybe an ice cream or a cold beer on the way up before returning back down to the uh, the minibus park down in Gavani. Birding here on the way is really good. Things like rock bunting. Got plenty of species that like the montane scrub. Things like uh, redback shrike. And then up in the sort of more open areas, we often find uh, uh, ring oozel, and this is the alpestris race that has this kind of really white scaly looking plumage. Good range of orchids in the cirques, things like uh, burnt orchid, tway blade, and uh, some of the uh, fragrant orchids as well. And yes, we get into the, um, into the Cirque de Gavani to see one of Europe's biggest waterfalls, the Grand Cascade, makes a great lunchtime spot. There's often uh, masses of uh, things like uh, Pyrenean lily as well growing down here, uh, but often a bit of a look around the rocks at the back and you find things like this. This is Ramonda Myconi, um, a member of the African violet family um, that occurs within that area. Carnivorous plants, there you go, you've kind of got four species of butterwort that you'll find including the endemic longleaf butterwort in a day trip there and uh more of a connoisseur's plant but many people are quite keen to see the pyrenean yam uh, trailing through the scree i think like kerry was saying going back to the same place every year is really great for me because one year is not like the next this is a cirque de tremousse one year the following year, it was like that, absolutely covered in snow, given a range of opportunities for other species, things like the soldanellas pushing through the uh, through the snow. And up in the cirque backs here, again, the birding's really good. Snowfinch, alpine accenter, alpine chuff that feed uh, feed from you, your hand at the picnic time. And if you're lucky, the elusive wall creeper on some of the limestone cliffs at the back. Gentians galore, a good range. Trumpet gentians, spring gentians, alpine gentians. Yeah, birders, botanists, butterfly enthusiasts, herpetologists really love this trip. So I'll leave you there with my final slide. It's the uh, a kind of meadow full of the endemic Ranunculus guanii and uh, big bulky Narcissus bichlor overlooking the Cirque de Gavani in the background. Thank you, David. That's wonderful ah, to finish us off. So, Bruce, if you're ready, don't forget to lean in and speak up so we can hear you all the way from Cornwall. Um, when you're ready, over to you. OK, hello. Good evening. Um, I do apologise about if you can see a picture of me because I'm all very blurred because um, I have very bad reception here in, um, in down in Cornwall and Bodmin. Um, Anyhow, um, just to say a little bit about myself, I, I've only been with Nature Trek for about five years now, um, and uh, but I and I've only been doing European tours. I do quite a few at home here, 
um, but previously um, I've heard about, well, I've been into the nature thing for at least 30 years professionally, and I was part of setting up the South Downs National Park Authority, uh, which is now running now. So, uh, um, and I was started off as a ranger and then went on to as countryside manager, did project manager, and all sorts of things like that. Um, and now I've uh, moved down to Cornwall and I have my own little plot of land and I manage that part of its uh, special site of scientific interest with things like Cornish money words and uh, violets and things like that. Um, and, um, I also look after some rare breeds, so uh, old English goats to help manage my meadows for my orchids and, and uh, the Devon and Cornwall longwall sheep. And, uh, you might see a picture of me there. I'm holding a Dorking chicken because that's where I originate from, from Surrey, Dorking. So uh, no more do. Um, so actually, this view here is um, Mittersee um, in Austria, in the uh, Austrian so on, on the go slow in Austria trip. Um, so if you do come on that, we'll have this fantastic view. Anyhow, what I'm going to do, I've done it slightly differently. Um, I'm, I'm going to combine the two tours that I um, lead. Um, so I lead from one in Bavaria and I lead one in uh, Austria. And um, the Bavaria one's quite strange uh, because usually you fly into uh, Salzburg and then you drive by minibus into uh, Bavaria. However, this year, because of flights and things like that, uh, we'll be actually flying to Munich and then I'll drive a bit longer uh, across to, uh, to the hotel here in this uh, reason, um, the Alpine Hotel, which is a really very nice um, hotel. Uh, lovely views all around. And you can just about make out perhaps um, the shape of a witch's head there on the horizon there. Um, and then over in Erwald, um, we have um, a very, very um, amazing place. I mean, uh, uh, the clients said, I wanted to make a little um, thing. I said, I've, I've never been in a bedroom as large as that in my life. You know, like that. So, so, so I was quite, um, um, well, I have to admit that my bedroom is enormous as well. So it's, it's a hotel well worth going to, to visit. Um, and um, you yeah, have fantastic views all around you as well. So, um, and in both hotels, wonderful staff, really, really friendly. Lots of lots of nice things to drink, and everyone is extremely friendly. So, uh, well worth visiting. So, um, just roughly, um, um, Show Bruce, us. I'm just going to interrupt. Can you just um, lean as far in and, and talk right. as loud as you can? can you it's not quite hear, quite. So that's really better. That now. is better. Yeah. That's all better. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So um, I, th I thought I'd show you something different. I thought I'd get a satellite picture so you can see the whole of the Alps that we've been talking about like that. So we're, um, but we're sort of roughly um, up in the uh, the north right sort of corner. So there's Erwald and then there's Bischof Riesen um, there as well. So um so you get a bit of an idea there and that's you can see it's italy that sort of helps support um the, the alps there so i thought it made a nice quite nice picture put it all in perspective so um there are, we do go up some mountains but um some of them are quite high and so we do get a nice varied um variety of things but some things are not quite as exciting as uh you heard and it was and as um, kerry mentioned um, it's very variable. It just depends on what the the weather's doing. Um, oh, and um, so this um, this last year was quite interesting, and in that it started off very cold, and then it was very very warm, and that accelerated everything. So then it was really quite difficult to predict, you know, what you could actually see out there. Um, so some things had accelerated, and then some things were. As normal as you'd expect and things like that so it's quite interesting um however when we go to um bavaria um and the jenna uh we go up to the jenna mountain that's the highest mountain we go up so um as you can see it's um 100 and well, 1874 meters high uh, and um and you get uh 
lots of alpine chuff there, as well as if you go up the Sudspritz mountain, um, if you don't want to go slow trip, um, but that's 2,962 meters. Um, that's a lot higher. And that's quite an interesting one because um, we go up the cable car um, and we get up to the top and then you have the opportunity to then go over a small little bridge and you go into, into Germany. And of course, Germany claim that this mountain, of course, is, it, well, it is their highest mountain. So, uh, so they're very proud to go there. Um, so it, it, it's quite interesting, um, the, the thing and with the go slow um, trip in Austria, um, lots and lots of cable cars um, and they're all very varied. So some are very modern, some are very sort of vintage. So it's quite exciting. <clears throat> um, and when we get up onto the Alpine Meadows, um, we see as we see many of the things that have been mentioned earlier, but um, we do get our gentians, uh, we get lots of the false um, calibrines, um, lots of the beautiful globe flowers. Um, have um, more clusius um, um, gentians um, there up on the right, gone over either, and um, certainly in the, um, the Austrian uh, part. And, and then there's a few more of the Trumpix uh, gentians, more in Bavaria. Um, there's the nice, lovely striated um, Missourian. Um, you see, and um, we do see quite a lot of the animals like here that, uh, that keep the meadows in, um, in order. Um, it's like there are the cattle here and quite a few goats and sometimes some sheep. And the interesting thing is that um, because of um, the fear actually of uh, wolves now uh, moving into the Alps, um, they seem to have a lot more bells around the necks nowadays. So, uh, so everybody's deafened by, uh, um, by bells if you, <laughs> if you see any of the grazing animals up there. So it's quite interesting. Me now, um, now be get, being a farmer now, it's sort of uh, it's something that I, I certainly wouldn't do here. I wouldn't have bells around my animals' necks. Um, so I think after a few months, they'd be deaf. Um, and then up, up in the mountains there, we have uh, um, some, um, some nice, well, and up above the, um, and just below, sort of down, uh, we get these nice sort of uh, conifer woodlands um, um, where we might see uh, things like the, the, the crested titmice uh, and um, certainly buzzards. Um, and, um, I haven't got a picture here, but um, you saw some pictures earlier, like the nutcracker, they're the things that we keep looking out for. And, uh, and then some of the woodland flora things like um, the yellow wood violet. Uh, we see down there uh, a lot of other things because it, it always depends on what time of the, the year and what the seasons have been doing um, so we keep an eye out for things like that but when we're um, in Erwald um, in Austria on the go slow trip there's a, a beautiful large woodland it's a bit like pasture woodland but um, this is it's a conifer woodland instead so um, it's rather interesting and you can look out for what seem to be field fair nesting in there and lots of spotted woodpeckers and siskin and we see a nutcracker in there uh, and uh, I don't know if you can just about make out on the edge there um, there's a lot of um, the dark form of the uh, red squirrels in that wood as well so that's something you can just wander out from the hotel and wander around and, and, and just see that um, but we do um, make a point of uh, going for a, a walk and that um, through there uh, later on in the week so so then we we have um, a couple of boat trips. So we have boat trips on both tours, and this one's rather nice um, uh, here. So uh, um, we go out and look at this uh, church and everything. And this is in Bavaria, um, and uh, on the boat we often see the great crested grebe, uh, and um, we uh, we also actually have a, a demonstration of. Um, a horn being blown, um, um, so you can hear the um, uh, the echo throughout the whole of the valley as well, like that. So that's quite an interesting, entertaining um, um, trip. Um, and uh, when we go into Austria, there's a height of Angersay. Um, that's uh, another very interesting sort of trip. But what we tend to do is we walk part of the way, look at some of the flowers, and look out at um, and see some of the fish here, like the trout and. Um, some amphibians like frogs and um, but we do get quite a few orchids along the edge here and um, so that's rather nice um, 
but uh, you, you have to think about this one is that um, you have to, you can only do one um, boat trip there and back. So uh, you either do the whole thing and then you miss something or you, so we, we decide on the day um, what we're going to do. Uh, now, um, river systems, there are some, um, some very nice sort of rivers. And so this is actually in, um, back in Bavaria. Uh, and we're going up the Vimbach uh, Valley here. And you can see on the right hand side, um, the gorge. Uh, and uh, quite lucky that there was actually a dipper nest, which was more or less opposite this little bridge. Um, and you can go across and see that. Now, what's fascinating about this particular valley is as you make your way further up, you can um, find that um, there's a lot of this limestone sort of debris that's coming off the mountains and it's just coming off in tons and tons and tons and tons and as you go out you end up in this big sort of big plateau area of this debris and over the years things have, um, have fallen off the mountains actually established down there so you do actually get odd things like uh, the alpine toad flax and uh, edelweiss as well so right down in the valley and not up in the top of the mountains so, uh, so it's well worth going to, to see that. But of course it depends again, because if it's really hot that day, as it was one time when I did it, um, you know, you can get really, uh, you need to have lots of refreshment with you. Um, and then the other day, I think it was raining. So, um, so you want to try and get out of the rain. So um, anyway, they're all very exciting. And there's, um, a, anyway, there's a lovely cafe um, further up the valley like that. And so you can have lots of your, uh, your schnitzels and your beers and your, coffees and your ice creams and all those sort of things like that and uh, so it's well worth um, going up the valley and then coming back again um, but um, back in Erwald uh, in, in Austria you have the uh, you have a number of streams that we're going to see as well so we have this rather unusual little uh, flower tosia um, that grows right on the end of the, of the stream like that and we'll see grey wagtails and we'll see dippers as well um, things like that. but um, there's lots and lots of lovely things happening through the woods there uh, that love the, the wetness and the streams. So um, some of the mammals um, that we, we see, I, I do warn you though that you, um, you will, you'll need to uh, bring the uh, your binoculars um, because you don't, apart from um, on the Bavarian trip, we can see the marmots fairly close. Uh, however, um, with the marmot, the um, that they're always looking out obviously for uh, eagles above them and uh, now vultures um, but um, what tended to happen where we were we, we had um, some glider people that had actually made their gliders into the shape of a golden eagle and this absolutely petrified one of these marmots um, but what's fascinating about the marmot is that it's it just stands absolutely still and it will not move, you know, like that, but it squeaks as loud and it goes right across the whole valley and everything like that. And, um, and I kept, kept saying, you know, there it is, there it is. And I'm saying, well, there's a stick there, but what, where, where's the marmot? Where's the marmot? And of course, the marmot looked just like a stick. It was unbelievable. It would not move, but it was in this sort of strange pose. It was amazing. Um, but um, so, um, but otherwise, you need your, your binoculars or a scope or something like that and uh, to see the chamois usually and uh, certainly an ibex. And what you do is you, you look on the uh, sort of horizon line on the mountains like that and you might just make out the silhouette of it. But, um, they are there. But, um, and up in the woodlands um, then we may get lucky but again it depends on the season but um, I, I did find um, coral roots um, and um, we found lady slipper at different stages, um, um, but um, they, it, because it had been so warm, it was so they were starting to go over. I have to admit, and even within because I did um, uh, the Austrian trip um, uh, twice back to back, and uh, the first week there were lots of sword leaf hellebrine still all around, and then by the second week they pretty well nearly disappeared. So, so it's. it's it's a very, very quick um, um, system that's what's happening out there like that. So you, you can never really predict what's going to happen, what you can see, but that's what makes it exciting. But then you do usually see, if you keep your eyes peeled, you'll see fly orchids. Um, and in Airbald, there's this amazing um, wet area down below and you get the lovely things like the marsh hellebrine uh, there. And, and you even get um, round leaf 
at um, some Jews and uh, or in the Drosera and things like that. So um, lots and lots of um, cotton grass as well. Uh, so uh, really, really quite nice sort of things. Um, as been mentioned earlier, that there's a nice variety of butterflies, and this is just a tiny little bit, really, to give you an idea of what, what there is out there. There's, there's masses of other uh, fertilities. I'm only showing you just a few. Um, lots and lots of blues, um, uh, lots of browns, obviously, things like that. So uh, um, absolutely um, amazing and uh, nice to see large blues, uh, especially um, where we are going in uh, Bavaria. And that's it's quite an interesting thing. You go at, uh, to the Klaus Bachtel uh, um, mountain sort of range area, and uh, you go down this valley and you go up on a bus, you go up and you actually go into Austria, and then we walk down and we walk down to um, Intersee. Um, and as you're coming down, you see all these uh, interesting things like that. And uh, there's this uh, nice little sort of interval place where you can stop off and you can. Um, there's a, a telescope sort of mounted like that, and you can hopefully see the you can see the eerie of a golden eagle. Um, um, and, but also, the, um, as was mentioned earlier, um, there's lammergeier um, now in the valley. We didn't actually see a lammergeier, but we did, we did see griffin vulture instead. Um, but um, so hopefully, um, um, as the years carry on with us, that tour, that we'll, we'll, we'll carry, we will see um, uh, lammergeier. So. Um, um, and then with the, on the herb side, um, we saw quite a few sort of um, interesting um, reptiles and amphibians. Um, when it was really sort of wet, we were sort of lucky in the, in the woodland areas, you could quite sort of see the, the alpine salamander. Um, but otherwise, the things like the adder, the slow worms, and sand lizards as well. So, um, now, one of the other um, special things. Um, um, we might be lucky um, from the first trip this uh, year. Um, they have a solstice fire festival in the Erwald area, um, and it's between sort of three valleys. And I don't know if you can really make that out, but um, um, about 200 people go out and trek out up into the mountains and they um, set up these um, light displays with real fire. And in some places they actually um, have fires right along the mountain edge. So it looks very sort of Tolkien. So um, and this festival has been going on since the middle ages. So it's a, it's a world heritage um, event. It's rather unusual. And this year was all about, well, last year was all about peace really. So there was lots of doves of peace, lots of crosses, uh, but there was an Edelweiss and all sorts of things all out on the mountain. And I just thought it was going to last I don't know, 20 minutes or something like that. But these things, they burn on, so they're still burning there, so like two hours later up on the mountains. Absolutely amazing it was. And then if I wasn't amazed even more, um, you know, I thought, well, that, I've never seen anything like that in my life. Um, it was absolutely amazing. And of course, everybody said we were really lucky because the weather was fantastic. Uh, but also, um, then suddenly where we went to, we went right out into the middle of the valley below Erval, and um, there's, Two other villages, Biba there and Lermus, um, around it, surrounding like that. And so they, it was, you were surrounded by this light festival up on the mountains. And where we were down in, in the sort of wet um, grass area like that, it was all covered in fireflies. So it was absolutely amazing. So you not only had the human interaction with, you know, but you also had the, the natural sort of thing happening at that time of the year as well. So. Um, Absolutely amazing. So I can't guarantee you have the fire festival, but we can, I can guarantee we can go down and see the fireflies, which were equally as fascinating and as amazing. Um, on the Bavarian trip, there is an added um, interesting sort of thing. Um, if you look down over, over this way, like that's where the hotel is actually, and you can look back up and here's the, what's rem just the remains of the eagle's nest, um, which was uh, where the Third Reich made um, lots of um, decisions um, um, before and during the war. Um, um, but there are still things you can see, nice sort of alpine plants up here and things like that. And if you go, uh, as we will do we, after that, we go on the Rossfeld Pass and uh, we, we can look out for um, the bald-headed ibis as well. Um, but what we did actually see was we did see some golden eagles. So, um, so you know, 
always have those bins with you and uh, uh, just never know what you might see. Now there's another interesting excursion um, with the Bavarian trip is that you, you actually go out of Germany and you go out into Austria and uh, we do a trip to Salzburg. So here you can uh, uh, go and see the, uh, the music house from the Sound of Music. Um, and, uh, but uh, also we can sample food, um, lovely cakes and things like that from the Tomaselli uh, Cafe. Um, rather nice. Um, and we do a little sort of a, a sneak view into the Salzburg Zoo. So if you don't see one of those ibex on the mountaintop, you'll certainly see one in the, in the zoo. Uh, and also obviously Mozart was born here in Salzburg. So, um, so it's, um, there's a lot of things to see. It's a bit of an unusual sort of excursion, but um, from the usual sort of nature track sort of thing, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite an adventure. Um, so there you go. Um, and then um, I've just been, uh, well, I need to say this really, there are still places available for the Austria Goes Flow Tour, um, which is on the 29th of June to the 6th of July. Um, and um, so, and uh, so you end up at the Hotel Alpine Residence in Erwald. Um, and as I said, it's, it's quite an amazing place. Um, and the great thing about the Go Slow tours is that um, um, I'll get you back by the, hopefully by half three or maybe a bit earlier than that. Um, and then that they serve cake, uh, they serve um, all sorts of things actually, sometimes soup at that time like that. Um, depending on what the weather's like and uh, and then uh, you have a little bit of a rest again and then it's another three course meal in the evening so uh, uh, they spoil you completely at that place so um, and uh, sometimes you do see um, a red version of the, the red squirrel rather than the uh, and the the, the, uh, the dark form so there you go um, so there are still spaces so okay Thanks very much, Bruce. Glad that held out. Well done. Uh, we'll hand over to Simon to wrap up the evening in the Carpathians. And remember, there are the question and answer chat. Answer if you have any questions for us, we'll come to those after Simon's spoken. Over to you, Simon. Right. Hope you can all hear me. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name's Simon Woolley. Um, I've been leading Nature Trek tours on and off for about 10 or 15 years, but mostly off. But I've done a lot more in the last couple of years since I um, uh, came out of teaching. Um, decided I had quite enough of that. Thank you very much. And I thought I'd spend a lot more time uh, in the wilds uh, sharing wildlife with people um, as much as I can um, throughout the year. So today I'm going to talk to you about, I hope, Hope you can see that all right. Uh, the Carpathian Mountains, which I've described here, I think it's probably true, as Europe's forgotten mountains. Haven't got um, the screen, Simon. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, sorry. Let's try that again. Thought I'd hit share screen. Try that one. Seeing now. Yep. Yeah. If you just go full screen on your presentation, should yep. be good to go. There we go. Can everyone see yeah, that? That looks good. good all unobscured. Right, lovely. Okay, um, so the Carpathians, uh, Europe's forgotten mountains is what I've called them. Um, and I think it's fair enough to describe them like that because a lot of people don't even know where they are. So that's going to be the first thing. Where are the Carpathians? Well, they're across here in Eastern Europe. Um, and they straddle several countries, as of course the Alps do, and as the Pyrenees do. They're an international mountain range, which is one of the lovely things about them. The Carpathians uh, start here in the west, in in fact Slovakia, uh, and then they go right along here, along the border with Poland. So there's Poland to the north, Slovakia to the south, and then they arch right round here through Western Ukraine, an area which Nature Trek doesn't currently offer tours to, but then south into this area here of Romania, where they continue right the way down towards the south, and then turn back west again, 
just north of the Danube Plain, which is this, this lowland area down here where the capital Bucharest is. The mountains then continue on for several hundred more kilometers right across the uh, Danube cuts through them and they continue right down here into Serbia before effectively joining up with the Balkans, which are a little bit further south. So this great arc of mountains going from Slovakia and Poland through Ukraine and right down into Romania. Now, Nature Trek does offer um, tours to the Slovakian mountains in this sort of area here, mainly for butterflies, uh, but also plants in that area too. And there is also a very exciting mammals trip, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit later on in this southeastern corner of um, uh, Poland, in an area here called Bischadi, which in fact pushes that it's the little, little peninsula of Poland that sticks right into Ukraine. Absolutely secure, perfectly safe. The trip is running this year, and in fact, just in a couple of weeks' time. Um, but I'm mainly going to be talking to you about my experiences um, in this part of the Carpathians, in the Romanian Carpathians. So let's get started then. Now, this is the vision we have, and we've seen this vision, when we think of um, European mountain habitats and the wonderful landscape and scenery. This is the Polish Tatras, which if you remember is this part of the Carpathians right up here in the north. This is the highest and most truly alpine part of the Carpathians, but it's actually a bit of an anomaly. Most of the Carpathians, while they may have montane, alpine, largely tree-free uh, peaks in the uh, in the background as the backdrop as it were, most of the Carpathians are actually much, much lower, gentler, more kind of rolling mountains. In some areas, more like a range of hills uh, than like the true sort of jagged mountain peaks. So they're rather more subtle than the Pyrenees uh, or the Alps. And they make a very refreshing change for all that. And they're a beautiful mix of picturesque villages in various different styles. Um, there are um, open grassy meadows and then woodlands which change as you go up the mountains, mostly dominated by beach at the lower altitudes. And then as you go up, you can start to see the first few silver fir trees appearing here. And then when you get up really high, you'd expect many more fir and pine species dominating before you reach the tree line uh, way up here, at maybe two and a half thousand, maybe 2000 meters or so. So it's a really varied habitat, but rather a gentler mountain range than the Alps or the Pyrenees. They do get very snowy in the winter, but the snow melts rather earlier in the spring. So the walking season uh, starts a little bit earlier. And during the, um, the months that Nature Trek tends to go there during May right through to August for different sorts of trips, the snow has certainly gone from the areas that we visit. Um, there may still be some remnant snow patches on the very, very highest peaks, but they're very, very beautiful, extraordinarily empty. And what's really remarkable about the Carpathians is that it's like stepping back in time. In Romania in particular, a country that only joined the EU, uh, well, a few years before we left it, but um, only joined the EU quite recently, its agricultural system is really... Um, the sort of thing that you might have found in Britain in the 19th century or at latest the early 20th century. So you see uh, hay meadows everywhere with hay that is cut still by hand with sides uh, in June uh, and then put to dry on these ricks or various structures that you see. So these what I like to call hay monsters dotted around the lowland landscape. And this means that you have a very, very flower rich habitat in the spring and then in the summer you have the grassy swards and the woods filled with lots and lots of um, quite often quite common European birds, but they are in extreme abundance. You can even see up at the top of the screen here that in some areas strip farming is still uh, practiced. So it really is this return to an earlier age. Lots and lots of wooden buildings, horse drawn um, and indeed horse worked agriculture going on. Um, shepherds still uh, tending their flocks high in the mountains, moving their animals up and down. It's, it's still um, this remarkable uh, survival of medieval European agriculture. And this means, of course, that the birds associated with agricultural landscape 
um, have survived and are indeed thriving still in these landscapes. So one of the commoner birds, in fact, that you see in the Romanian lowland areas of the Carpathians, down in the, riv in the river valleys, in the agricultural areas, in this case sitting on top of a rusty old tractor, are things like red-backed shrikes, which of course have sadly been lost from Britain and are declining in most of Western Europe, but are still delightfully abundant in um, Southeast Europe, notably in Romania. Another absolutely common and typical bird of these river valleys, the agricultural areas, lots and lots of white storks feeding, looking for invertebrates, frogs, insects, grasshoppers, and so on in the fields, and then flying into the towns. There's storks' nests uh, right opposite our um, hotel, which we'll see in a few moments' time, um, in the uh, little Romanian mountain town of Vulcan, which is so named because it's right opposite an extinct volcano. Extinct, that's the good news. Uh, so lots of white storks around, but there are also more spectacular and unexpected species, things like lesser spotted eagles, one of just, um, just one of a whole range of different raptors, uh, which can be seen um, flying around the meadows and over the mountains and over the woodlands and so on. Uh, and you can expect a whole range of those. Uh, two different species of buzzards can be seen in this area. There are hobbies are common, all sorts of birds of prey uh, to be seen. And the lesser spotted eagles, they will often drop right down into the farmed areas and you can see them hopping around on the ground right by the side of the road. So here's a photo uh, that I took of uh, the group I led to Romania last May. Um, so as I was explaining to you, most, most of the habitation is down here in little towns and villages in the valley floor. Um, and then as you gradually go up the sides of the valleys, go through these open pastures and meadows and so on, and then higher up still into open woodlands and then denser woodlands. And then eventually, were you to get all the way up high into the mountain tops, uh, you might get into the true alpine environments. We don't tend to do that in Romania because it's a serious mountaineering undertaking to get up that high. And the infrastructure of things like cable cars and flashy little mountain railways that we've been seeing in Switzerland earlier on simply don't exist. So to get up onto the top of the mountains at the back there, the Crialu Mountains, uh, would be a, a sort of a two, three day expedition to fully traverse that ridge. So don't worry, no one's going to be expecting you to do that. Instead, we go for gentle day walks. This is the steepest track that we went on um, during our time in the Romanian Carpathian Mountains. And I think you'll agree it doesn't look overly challenging. Bit of an uphill, but there's a wonderful little, well, there's the bus there, and there's a wonderful cafe just there, which does some of the best ice cream um, this side of Istanbul. Anyway, as you go up, as you get into the woodlands, then you encounter a species that's been mentioned uh, more than once, I think, this evening, and that is the resplendent nutcracker, which is a member of the crow family, believe it or not, I suppose you can, just about. Uh, but this is a very, very sought after species. It breeds quite widely in Scandinavia and in the mountains of Southern Europe, but it's often really quite hard to get to grips with, uh, despite having a raucous call and sometimes flying over the forest canopy, it can be quite tricky to find. So we do spend a fair bit of time in the right sort of habitat, listening, scanning, watching closely. In the spring, they're actually quite hard to locate. But later on in the summer, when they've got youngsters, like this one over here, you can tell which the immature bird is, can't you? Um, you can see they get very, very noisy. They're chasing around after their parents, begging for food. And they'll very often sit right up on the top of the pine trees um, and show perfectly for everyone to see uh, really, really well. So nutcracker is one of these really sought after species, exceptionally rare in Britain, but thankfully much easier to see in Europe's mountains. If you do get up really high, and this isn't an area that we visit on the particular tour that I led last May, um, then you'll find true alpine specialities. So, for example, golden eagles live and nest up on those high crags, but of course they cover such large areas that we stand a very, very good chance of seeing them soaring over the mountains as we just walk around in the valleys and on the valley sides. Uh, up in the heights, there are the true alpine species, Alpine Accenta here. This is uh, one that I photographed in the Polish part of the 
Carpathians, but they do exist at these higher altitudes, but they're really quite hard to get to. However, earlier on this evening, you were shown one of the most sought after of all the montane species. Now, normally you have to climb to, in the Pyrenees, for example, to something like 3000 meters or above, sometimes even higher to even stand a chance of this next species. However, in Romania, we have a secret site. This involves walking up this very easy, barely uphill graded track alongside a bubbling brook with gray wagtails and dippers, um, zipping up and down the river, a lovely little half hour walk along this track until we get to this little concrete bridge. We then gather by the side of the road. We pause, we wait, we look with anticipation at this crack in the rock. I'm giving very, very detailed gen in this particular instance, and we wait. And then we hope, and indeed last May it happened, as if by magic, the wall creeper appears from around one of the headlands, lands on the cliff face, and we were very, very lucky that the bird we saw uh, last year was singing, building a nest, even dropping down onto the path only about 10 meters away from us, flicking its wings, flashing those brilliant crimson flashes in the wings. It's one of the most accessible known sites for wall creeper. So um, if you're perhaps a little bit daunted by climbing up the very, very highest moraine and boulder covered screes of the Alps or the Pyrenees, you do stand a realistic chance we never use the word guarantee in wildlife tour leading. As Clint Eastwood once said, if you want a guarantee, buy a toaster. But you do have a very realistic chance um, of connecting with wall creeper in the Carpathians of Romania in the spring and summer. But it's not just about birds. I'm not going to talk about plants for two reasons. We've had lots and lots of fantastic plants. Secondly, Actually, there's three reasons, really. Secondly, I don't really know all that much about um, the botanical side of things. It's certainly not my specialism. And thirdly, Nature Trek doesn't currently, at least, run purely or overwhelmingly botanical tours to the Carpathians. That may change in the future because there are a lot of exciting endemic um, and rather exotic Carpathian plants, but it's not a tour that we've got developed just at the moment. However, there are lots of wonderful things to see apart from the birds. First of all, there are the landscapes themselves. There's the vernacular architecture with the sort of fascinating barns and farm buildings and so on. Remote shepherd's huts in clearings, thatched roofs, which are only used during the summer season. Um, the uh, kind of Saxon style of the big sort of A-framed symmetrical uh, buildings. And this, in fact, is the um, hotel that I mentioned to you earlier on, a really beautiful um, converted Saxon farmhouse with absolutely immaculate rooms, superb food, stripped wood floors everywhere, and a delightful guardian garden out the back with Syrian woodpeckers in it. It's a really lovely place to stay in a lovely quiet village um, in one of the valley floors. It's not just um, functional architecture, there's also this gothic fantasy of a uh, royal hunting lodge perched up amongst the woodlands filled with red-breasted flycatchers uh, and other delights of the, um, uh, the mountain forests. And then perhaps most notoriously is this. This is Bran Castle, which stands at the gateway to Transylvania. So as you enter the uh, Carpathian uh, mountains from uh, Bucharest from the south. The first town you come to is Bran. Um, now this has variously been alleged to have been one of the homes or um, owned by Vlad Tepes, um, the infamous Vlad the Impaler, uh, and indeed it's also been alleged to be, ah, this is Dracula's castle. This is what Bram Stoker had in mind when he was writing his novel in the late 19th century. I'm afraid I have to tell you that neither of these things is in fact true, but because this is the first plausible looking castle that you come to when you get to Transylvania, the Romanian tourist board does give it a bit of a push. Nonetheless, we do go and visit Bran, have a nice meal there uh, and enjoy the somewhat touristy but quite entertaining uh, delights of Bran.
back to the wildlife, I think. Uh, there are lots and lots of butterflies to be seen. Many um, of the groups we've talked about earlier this evening, coppers, fritillaries, hair streaks, uh, purple emperor is uh, not uncommon in some of the woodlands. And this is a really subtle and delightful species, the map butterfly. Very interesting maps. They actually occur in two generations through the spring and summer. And the two generations look very, very different from each other, almost as though they were different species. But they are, in fact, the same species, but the two generations uh, just look almost completely different from one another. Fire salamander. I'm not sure whether this is the same uh, species as the alpine salamander we saw earlier, but the fire salamander, the um, male in all its glory, uh, with the yellow and black uh, finery is certainly a thing to see. And this is a realistic target in some of the wet woodlands, especially if it's been raining. So there's a, a thing to look forward to on one of those unfortunate wet days. But we do have a good chance of finding those in amongst the leaf litter. Mammals as well. The Carpathians are absolutely superb for mammals. They have an almost, com almost complete set of all the European, uh, certainly larger mammals. There are chamois up high, often visible on ledges, well out, of, uh, uh, well out of range, but you can see them quite easily and well with telescopes and binoculars. There are marmots in the Carpathians as well. Their Slavic name is Manushka. I don't, I don't actually know their Romanian name, but the, uh, they're known as Manushkas in Slovakia uh, and Poland, and they're delightfully common and confiding. There are bison in the Carpathians. This is a recent development. They've been reintroduced into the Carpathians where they went extinct several hundred years ago uh, from uh, Poland, where the last remaining wild herds of European bison hung on right out on the border with Belarus. Uh, but they've been reintroduced to the Southern Carpathians in some quite restricted areas and certainly areas without good general access. It's not the best place to go and look for European bison. Uh, that's still um, your best bet is one of the Eastern Poland uh, tours where you have a very realistic chance of, of seeing them. And of course, they're true wild species that have been there you know, since time immemorial. This, however, the Eurasian lynx is uh, one of the stars of the Carpathians. There is a healthy population of Eurasian lynx. They are, I think it's fair to say, almost never seen by the general public. But um, as I mentioned um, earlier on, I think um, Nature Trek runs a trip um, into the far southeast of Poland, focusing strongly on the difficult, rare and tricky mammals especially the real jewel in the crown is Eurasian lynx. It's by no means guaranteed, but there has been a good success rate um, in recent years. This is an even harder species to see, in fact, than the much rarer, in terms of global population, Spanish lynx, which some of you might have uh, encountered down in uh, Iberia. However, there is one mammal for which Romania's Carpathians are justly famous, and give you an excellent chance of seeing. And you will see the signs, things like footprints and sometimes scat and markings on trees. Um, and when you see these big, very big, fresh footprints, you should genuinely be just a little bit cautious because there's bears in those woods. Now, the European brown bear is in fact the same species as the North American grizzly bear, different subspecies, but the Romanian Carpathians are one of the most accessible places for seeing these animals in their natural habitat. Now, you will find cheap knockoff tours that will take you to a rubbish dump or the bins around the back of McDonald's in some grim area in a mountain town. And as we know, know I think of a fed bear is a dead bear, certainly in that sort of environment. However, up in the mountains for several decades now, They've been developing um, a sustainable form of ecotourism where small amounts of semi-natural food are put out for the bears and small populations of the bears have become habituated. They're absolutely wild animals. And if you make significant noise when you're sitting in the hide viewing the bears, they will scarper and be gone and that'll be it. They're extremely shy, extremely wary, but you stand a very, very good chance of encountering encountering European brown bear in the European uh, in the Romanian 
Carpathians. And if you're quiet, if you're lucky, if you're patient, if you sit still and don't make lots of rustling and banging in the very comfortable hides, then you stand a good chance of encountering not just the odd bear, but last May we saw no fewer than 11 brown bears, including three family parties of mothers with cubs of different ages. And that's a real privilege to be so close to such an awesome um, and iconic large predatory animal. However, we did manage to best that. Um, and I'm going to share, I've saved the very best sighting till last on that trip we did last May. Um, when we were in that same gorge where we saw the wall creeper earlier on, one member of the group detected movement in the undergrowth, I would say undergrowth, more leaf litter and rocky scree on the side of the valley. So we all froze and stopped. And then someone else said, oh, I saw it again, it just moved. It went into that hole in the rock. So we all set up our binoculars and telescopes and waited and paused, our, our breath held, waiting for the, what we thought it might possibly be. And we thought, surely it can't be. But what, what came out was a species so rare that I think I'm right in saying it's the first time it has ever been recorded by a nature trek trip. And we all dined out on this one. So we did manage to get one photo, a brief snap photo in the gloom of the beech forests of the Carpathians. We managed to see a montane water vole, a fearsome predator, as you can see terrifying to the invertebrate prey on which it feeds. The montane water vole has recently, in fact, been split from the European lowland water vole and is its own species. And as I say, we think that was the very first time it's ever been recorded on a nature trek trip. So rather exciting. Well, forgive my attempt at comedy, I hope, but there it is. It, it's very peculiar because it lives in the leaf litter, as you can see. It doesn't spend its time swimming up and down rivers. It spends its time mostly in the woodlands. So it does seem to have a very different way of behaving from its lowland cousin. So as the sun sets over the Romanian Carpathians, we'll um, bring things to a close there. Uh, and I'll hand back over to um, Kerry, who I'm sure will... Um, take over with any questions and hopefully answers. <laughs> Can but who? Thank you so much, Simon. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, let's welcome back Bruce and David. I think I turned some of their cameras off, so just pop them back on again. Um, and if anyone has any questions at all, then this is your moment. So, um, and usually we have no questions in our Q&A box. Maybe everyone knows the, the European mountains quite well. Maybe been once or twice before. Um, we've got, let's have a look at the chat as well. <laughs> Tell you what, well, if we'll wait and see if one or two questions pop in, let's have your um, Alpine wildlife highlights from all the panelists. When you got back out of COVID, you went to the mountains last summer. Tell me, David, your favorite moment. Was it stepping off the plane and realising you weren't in the England anymore? Well, I mean, the oh, apples yeah. in close, but um, uh, no, I, I think it was like Lanagaya. La it's it's something that I've kind of longed to see come back to that part of the Alps. So, uh, yeah, most of the group was actually in the loo at a cable stop and um, it came soaring overhead and had to kind of run in and bang on the door. <laughs> get out of the toilet. <laughs> That was uh, definitely a highlight for us uh, last year. Go on, Simon, you got one. We'll let the next questions pop in. Uh, well, I was very lucky, as well as leading in the Carpathians, um, I also did a trip to, as you know, Kerry. Yeah, carry on. The, can you hear me? I can, can yeah, me? yeah, go, yeah. go on. Apart, yeah. apart, apart from the water bowl, obviously. But I was very lucky I led uh, trips to the Romanian Carpathians, the Julian Alps in Slovenia, um, and the Pyrenees. So I visited all three of those mountain ranges over the course of the spring and summer. And I guess for me personally, I have to say one of my embarrassing bogey birds that I'd never seen, despite several visits to these areas in the past on my own, was snowfinch. Um, and I managed to see snowfinch not once, but twice, both in the Pyrenees and in Slovenia. So purely selfishly, I think that was probably it. But the snowfinch site 
um, in Slovenia uh, at the Mangurt Saddle is an absolutely astonishing alpine yeah. flower location. And just spending the whole day up at high altitude in a tr completely traffic free environment, walking along a beautiful paved road with just rockeries, of just vast swathes of alpine flowers. We could have spent the whole week just in that one site. Uh, yeah, we didn't include Sweden in this time, but we, we definitely could have done. Do you Maybe know next another, time. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, I think we did last year. We'll bring it back next year for sure. Um, best that one for you, David. Best place to see nutcrackers. We've mentioned them several times this evening. You've done a few of these tours. What do you reckon? So, yeah, I mean, I've seen them in on quite a few tours throughout Europe, places like es the forests in Estonia and that. But I'd have to say that Valets trip that I talked about is the single best place I've ever found nutcrackers. I mean, you basically see them out of your hotel bedroom balcony window. I mean, they're all around the hotel and they kind of greet you as soon as you get off the cable car. And we had like parties feeding in the high street in in uh, Bet Betmar yeah. this last summer. So, yeah. The, the, I would agree. As nailed, on, yeah. as nailed on as you can get. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not a pro birder, more of a botanist or enthusiastic beginner, but um, I easily, even seven months pregnant and walking at very slow speed and pottering around, saw plenty of nutcrackers in ballet. Good choice. Um, Brian is after walking distances in the Carpathians. One for you there, Simon. How far do you go each day? Would you reckon? Yeah, I've just I've just typed an answer. Oh, have to you? That one. Yeah. But yeah, well, um, others might be listening. But but but, but, but yeah, the, the Carpathian ones. I would say maximum three or four miles. Bit of an incline up, but what goes up must come down. So half of it's downhill. So you know, but certainly yeah. no scrambles or high, you know, airy scrambles at all. Uh, at no, all. and that would be oh, the case, I think, across yeah. our European tours. You're never going to be doing difficult Challenge, walking. Yeah. Chal no, it's um some. Um, has more walking than others definitely in Switzerland we're, we're out and about on our feet all day and you don't have that backup yeah. of minibuses yeah um, someone else has just asked about about Romania while I'm yeah. on what time of year was it to see bears with cubs and would nature Trek do bear watching in Romania um, yes I mean the bears are, are visible you know almost throughout the season there were bears with I mean yeah, they're not tiny tiny cubs uh, usually at that time of year but um, when I was there in May um, certainly the bears, as I said, three females with with cubs of one and two years old. Uh, and it was amusing to see them climbing up the trees when a big burly male appeared in the clearing and the cubs would climb up the trees and look down and so on. So, yeah, May, June, July, right through the summer, all good for um, for bear watching uh, in Romania. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to say check the website, but, you know, all, all of those tours throughout the, the spring and summer season, uh, all equally good. Um, another one, any of you speakers, have any of you found dwarf alpine orchid on any of your tours? I Come found it in the Dolomites. Yeah. Yeah, I found it in the Dolomites. And I mean, it, it, it should be in the Pyrenees and the Alps as well. So, uh, yeah, it's just, yeah, like a tiny yeah. frog orchid. So it's quite, quite a tricky one. But uh, yeah, I've definitely found it in the Dolomites. I've just not, yeah, we've not really... I've not known. Bruce, yeah, Bruce, have you had that in Austria? No, haven't. No, been. no, sorry, I'm thinking something else. I, then. No, no. I'm, I'm thinking we saw that in the Slovenia. As I said, I know botany specialists, but I'm thinking we saw it in the Slovenian Alps. I'm, I'm just oh, going to check. Some tour reports. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm just gonna, yeah. Um, Philip's asking about any tips to combat altitude sickness. Now, I would say, having been to the Engadine, which is one of the highest tours we do, I don't think we really get any altitude sickness, not, not in the European Alps. Um, I think occasionally people, um, isn't, not, and not compared with if you were doing match picture or something, I think people tend to get headaches. That's quite common on the first day or two. Um, I think drinking lots of water is always advised and staying hydrated. Um, any other tips from, from our panellists? Well, if it was South America, I'd say chew coca leaves, but you might get in a bit of trouble if you did that. Yeah, Europe, did I? I think, but yeah. no, but I'd, I, I would I would agree with Kerry. Um, you know, up at over three thousand meters in in the Pyrenees, no one in the group that I was aware of was having any any issues with altitude at all. I mean, you, you generally say that you can sort of feel altitude from three three and a half thousand meters. Yeah. Depends on the person and so on, but certainly 
nothing resembling altitude sickness at all. No. And bearing in mind, you're not sleeping at that altitude, which I think makes quite a big difference as well. You know, you're just, you're up there for a few hours at over 3,000 perhaps, but that's about it. Um, <laughs> Someone's asking, why are they into the Alps in the winter? It's a great question. Once you go in the summer, everything will change. Mm. <laughs> um, right. Any other bits and bobs? I think that's about it. So I think someone else is saying that they've seen nutcrackers in Wengen. Yeah, yeah. There's one, I'm sure um, our leader David Tassfield had one trained with Gruyere at one point. He used to, that, in fact, that final slide that I showed with the nice picnic spot on the Wengen tour, he used to just chuck a bit of Gruyere down and nutcracker would pop out. It was um, a little party piece every every group that he took <laughs> bribery and corruption <laughs> um, oh another question i won't stop yet uh one for you david any chance of seeing gavani blue in the pyrenees trip so i've never seen it and the reason is is it's we're often a little bit early for it um and also, there's so many blues, it would take kind of often netting them and going through them. And it, it would probably take quite a lot of time to, to nail one down. I've never found, I mean, it's, it's on my bucket list, but but I think we've, we've often, the timing has often been, we're just there a little bit too early for it. So it's, it's like any of these trips to the mountains, it's the timings there for a good range of butterflies and plants and birds, but it's it's some of the butterflies are the ones that are tricky ones that have got really restricted flight periods. And yeah, that's the one I've I've always missed. We're in the right area, so yeah. if someone's keen to go along and try and uh, there, there is the other the, there there is a trip that I'm likely co-leading in July. I think July the eighth. I think it is butterflies of the Pyrenees, which covers many almost exactly the same habitats and sites. That the, the the other Pyrenees trip Pyrenees trip does earlier in the season, but the focus is perhaps more on butterflies. And certainly, looking at the recent reports from that, that they have had Gavany blue um, in on on some occasions. It's by no means guaranteed, I don't think, and it, it's obviously a, a difficult species. But there is a, a dedicated butterfly focus trip in early mid July. Yeah, which is yeah. definitely the flight period. We're there mid mid June. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so that and a slice of luck and you might be in business. Um, uh, lots of nice comments, everyone saying thank you for a very enjoyable evening, evening in the mountains, lots of inspirational trips here. Um, someone's asked if there are any places on these tours for this year. Um, yes, there are. Um, so the best thing to do, we pop onto the Nature Trek website and there is a, um, a, there's a tour calendar and that will show availability there's you can just basically browse by month june july every tour is listed there if it says yes on availability then there's quite a few spaces still and then it starts counting down once i think it gets to six or five so then you can see how many places are left the only thing i would say is just don't leave it too late because at some point flights can get sold out and then we'd have to shut down the tour even when there's places left and um, at the rate things are going the last few weeks i think nature tracks had record booking weeks ever the last three weeks winning everyone is desperate to get out and travel and see our world's wonderful wildlife so um yeah the tours will fill up um but yeah pop on the website have a look at availability there or you can always just give the office a call and um and ask about the trips that you're most interested in and and we have to help um so thank you we will finish there for this evening thank you simon bruce david um thoroughly enjoyed your talks and as i said it's my favorite part of the world the european mountains however if i wasn't going to spend my summer in the european mountains i would be tempted by a wildlife cruise and if you would be as well then feel free to join us <laughs> next week um i'll be back with some um um of the operations managers and tour leaders um from the office on Wednesday the 8th of February. So we will be going to Baja California, Indonesia, the Galapagos and the west coast of Canada. What a lineup. So I very much hope you will choose to join us then. Um, if you're not signed up for that, you can do it on the website and we will look forward to seeing you then. Enjoy the rest of your evening, nearly the weekend, enjoy the weekend and we'll see you again soon. Thanks for joining us. Good night all. Bye.
Bye.